everyone at Savannah Dogs. We hope you're doing well. We just want to say that we love you and we miss you and we hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye. Hey. Hey church family, this is the Five Ashes. We hope you are all staying safe, staying inside, and we love and miss you all and can't wait till we can see you again. Okay. Does my hair look good? Do I look good? Stop. Stop. Are you going? Are you ready? Are you recording? No. <laughs> Hey church, we just want to hop on and say that we love you guys, we miss you guys, and we can't wait to see you guys. Uh, students, we are ready to get back and see you guys as well. Uh, ready to get back to just having fun and playing games. Can't wait to see you guys. Stay safe. Oh wait, 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 wait. wait. We didn't introduce ourselves. Oh. We're, ready? Uh, We're, we're the Genesis. <laughs> hey church, this is the Moors. I hope you guys have a great Sunday. We miss everybody. Can't wait till we see you. Take 25. Just want to tell everybody, church of Lake Forest, we miss them. Wish we could join together. Just sitting around here, hanging out, quarantine. Got Brooke making us some marshmallows. Uh, just want to tell everybody that we miss them. Y'all want to say anything? We miss you. We love you. Marshmallows. Hey, Church of Lake Forest, this is the Reese family. We really miss y'all and hope y'all are staying safe. Love y'all. Bye. Hi, everyone. It's Larry and Debbie from our garden in our backyard. We sure do miss you guys at the Church at Lake Forest, and we hope to see you real soon. Yeah, we have the sweetest church family and friends, and we really are missing you. We love each and every one of you. Sitting out here in the yard. Ooh, Larry, do you feel that? The breeze? Yeah. Yeah. You know what that reminds me of? What? It reminds me of Psalm 156, where it says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So, what do you think? You ready? Yeah. Three, two, one. Praise, praise the, the Lord. Lord. Hey, everybody. It's the Fox family. Hi, everybody. I miss you. I miss church. Yeah, yeah we're so excited that we get to worship with you online, and we hope you're all doing well. We hope you're doing well. We just want to say that we love you and we miss you and we hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye. Hey. hey, church family. This is the Five Ashes. We hope you are all staying safe, staying inside, and we love and miss you all and can't wait till we can see you again. Okay. Does my hair look good? Do I look good? Stop. Stop. Are you going? Are you ready? 
Oh, is he recording? Oh. <laughs> hey, church. We just want to hop on and say that we love you guys, we miss you guys, and we can't wait to see you guys. Uh, students, we are ready to get back and see you guys as well. Uh, ready to get back to just having fun and playing games. Can't wait to see you guys. Stay safe. Okay. Oh, wait, wait, oh. wait, wait. We didn't introduce ourselves. Oh. What? Ready? Uh, Where are the dentists? <laughs> Hey church, this is the Moors. I hope you guys have a great Sunday. We miss everybody. Can't wait till we see you. Take 25. Just want to tell everybody at church of Lake Forest we miss them. Wish we could join together. Just sitting around here hanging out, quarantine. Got broken making us some marshmallows. Uh, just want to tell everybody we miss them. Y'all want to say anything? We miss you. We love you. Marshmallows. Hey, Church of Lake Forest. This is the Reese family. We really miss y'all and hope y'all are staying safe. Love y'all. Bye. Hi, everyone. It's Larry and Debbie from our garden in our backyard. We sure do miss you guys at the Church at Lake Forest, and we hope to see you real soon. Yeah, we have the sweetest church family and friends, and we really are missing you. We love each and every one of you. Sitting out here in the yard, Ooh, Larry, do you feel that? The breeze? Yeah. Yeah. You know what that reminds me of? What? It reminds me of Psalm 156, where it says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So, what do you, what do you think? You ready? Yeah. Three, two, one. Praise, praise the, the Lord. Lord. Hey, everybody. It's the Fox family. Hi, everybody. I miss you. I miss church. Yeah. yeah, we're so excited that we get to worship with you online, and we hope you're all doing well. Bye-bye. Um, <laughs> Bye. Bye. want to say that we love you and we miss you and we hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye. Hey. hey church family, this is the Five Ashes. We hope you are all staying safe, staying inside, and we love and miss you all and can't wait till we can see you again. Okay. Does my hair look good? Do I look good? Stop. Stop. Are you going? Are you ready? Are you recording? Oh. <laughs> Hey church, we just want to hop on and say that we love you guys, we miss you guys, and we can't wait to see you guys. Uh, students, we are ready to get back and see you guys as well. Uh, ready to get back to just having fun and playing games. Can't wait to see you guys. Stay safe. Okay. Oh wait, wait, oh. wait, wait. We didn't introduce ourselves. Oh. What? Ready? Uh, Where are the, the dentists? <laughs> hey church, this is the Moors. 
I hope you guys have a great Sunday. We miss everybody. Can't wait till we see you. Take 25. Just want to tell everybody at Church of Lake Forest we miss them. Wish we could join together. Just sitting around here, hanging out, quarantine. Got Brooke making us some marshmallows. Uh, just want to tell everybody we miss them. Y'all want to say anything? We miss you. We love you. Marshmallows. Hey, Church of Lake Forest. This is the Reese family. We really miss y'all and hope y'all are staying safe. Love y'all. Bye. Hi everyone, it's Larry and Debbie from our garden in our backyard. We sure do miss you guys at the church at Lake Forest, and we hope to see you real soon. Yeah, we have the sweetest church family and friends, and we really are missing you. We love each and every one of you. Sitting out here in the yard. Ooh, Larry, do you feel that? The breeze? Yeah. Yeah. You know what that reminds me of? What? It reminds me of Psalm 156, where it says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So, what do you, what do you think? You ready? Yeah. Three, two, one. Praise, praise the, the Lord. Lord. Hey, everybody. It's the Fox family. Hi, everybody. I miss you. I miss church. Yeah. yeah, we're so excited that we get to worship with you online, and we hope you're all doing well. We hope you're doing well. We just want to say that we love you and we miss you and we hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye. Hey, hey church family. This is the Five Ashes. We hope you are all staying safe, staying inside, and we love and miss you all and can't wait till we can see you again. Okay. Does my hair look good? Do I look good? <laughs> Stop. Stop. Are you going? Are you ready? Oh, is he recording? Oh. <laughs> hey church, we just want to hop on and say that we love you guys, we miss you guys, and we can't wait to see you guys. Uh, students, we are ready to get back and see you guys as well. Uh, ready to get back to just having fun and playing games. Can't wait to see you guys. Stay safe. Okay. Oh wait, wait, oh. wait, wait. We didn't introduce ourselves. Oh. We're, ready? Uh, we're, we're the, the dentists. <laughs>
the roughest water I won't go under, I won't drown And when I'm in over my head I know that you won't let me down When I'm broken Down to nothing I know that you are always up to something good The deepest valley You go before me You are here For I know You'll never leave me Your love surrounds me I won't fear When I'm broken Down to nothing I know that
Alright guys, are y'all ready for some good news? Are you ready for some good news? Hey church, we have three stories of some good news to share with you today. First up, worshipers gathered last week outside of Baptist Hospital for an impromptu thank you worship flash mob style uh, worship gathering where they sang for and prayed for the frontline workers at the hospital. Check this out. de Janeiro, the very famous Christ the Redeemer statue, was lit up dressed as a healthcare professional with messages of thanks to healthcare workers in various languages and from various countries around the world. And finally, our very own Louis Corona, friends of Nathan and Kelly Moore who come to visit us every single year at the church, I believe. He is finally off his ventilator and recovering nicely from COVID-19. Luis Corona has helped hundreds of people as he served Monroe Township, Madison Township, and Eli Lilly Fire Departments. So when he went on the ventilator and his wife and kids got the virus, the community wanted to repay him for all he's done. Luis Corona went from fighting fires to bedridden all in one weekend. The virus spread through his family, infecting his wife and kids, but it got worse for him, putting him in the hospital. He'd actually worked a shift uh, on a Friday, I believe it was the 28th of March. And then uh, the next day, Saturday morning, he started to feel ill. Uh, went into the hospital, I can't remember if it was that night or the next day on Sunday. And then has been on basically on a ventilator since that, that Sunday, which I believe was the 29th. To help with hospital fees and any essential bills, the fire department started selling these hashtag Luis Strong signs. And they've started popping up all around town. 175 of them have been sold. On top of that, the fire department put up a GoFundMe that's already raised over $8,000 in just four days for Luis and his family. It's It's been crazy. I run the social media page for our fire department and since we started putting this out there, it's been all I could do just to keep up with the messages and comments and everything that's been sent to our page. After so many people have been rooting for him, Luis is finally off the ventilator. He still needs to go through some more treatment, but he's that much closer to coming home and seeing the support that's come his way. My son thinks the, you know, thinks the world of him. Uh, I mean, he's just all around great guy. He would do anything for anyone. Um, and I'm sure when he, you know, when he recovers from this, he's going to be so grateful to see what everyone's done for him and just wonder, you know, there's no way I'll ever be able to repay you guys for everything you've done. Way to go, Louie. Know that we have been praying for you and your family, and you will continue to be in our thoughts and prayers. Listen, church, if any of you have any good news stories that you would like for us to share next week, you can simply email us at info, that's I-N-F-O, info at tcaf.com. And, and finally, church, you have the opportunity to give back and to say thank you to healthcare workers by giving to a GoFundMe page that will purchase meal gift cards for frontline workers right here in DeSoto County. If you want more information about how to do that, just visit TCAF.com. Hey, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week at TCAF Church. Some good news. Bye, guys. What's up, Church at Lake Forest? Welcome to week one of SGN, Some Good News. Listen, I hope that this is an encouraging series. And so really where I want to start today is where we're all living, which is in the middle of you know coronavirus, COVID-19, in the middle of a pandemic. And, and quite frankly, uh, a lot of us are dealing with worry. And so what I want to do today is, is share a story of someone who really pretty unexpectedly had a very happy ending, but her story does not begin that way. Her story begins really 
uh, in, in kind of the worst possible way. It's from the book of Ruth. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and, and turn to Ruth. We're going to be in Ruth chapter 4 this morning. Uh, and, and what I want us to take a look at really is, is the very end of the story. It's the happy ending, right? It's, it's the good news part. But where we're going to be in Ruth, um, let, me, let me kind of set the, the stage for you. So Ruth has a mother-in-law. Her name is Naomi or Naomi. And Naomi has a husband named Elimelech. Right, and they've got these two sons, and so Naomi and Elimelech, <clears throat> they have they have left Israel because there's there's a drought, and so they go into the land of, of Moab. There's this famine, and they're just they're looking for food. Apparently, Elimelech is uh, is a man of, of good standing. Um, he he's a property owner. He's he's a good guy generally, and he's trying to take care of his family, uh, but he he leaves their homeland and, and moves into the land of the Moabites, and his two sons actually marry a couple of Moabite women. Well, not long after they move there, Elimelech dies. Naomi loses her husband. And then soon after that, both of the sons die. And so Naomi is left with two daughter-in-laws, one of whom is Ruth, who the book of Ruth obviously is named for. And she actually says to her two daughter-in-laws, she encourages them to go back home, to, to go back where... Everybody knows their name to, to, to go back and, and try to find some new husbands. They're young, they're beautiful, they don't have any kids yet. And so she's basically encouraging them to start over. But Ruth decides not to. She's the one daughter-in-law that says to Naomi, where you go, I'm going to go. Where you stay, I will stay. And she goes even one step further and says, your God will be my God. See, Ruth grew up on the other side of the tracks, right? She grew up worshiping some other household gods. But apparently she has learned from her late husband and learned from Naomi about this, this new God, this God that, that promises to take care of all of our needs. And I don't know exactly because Frankly, the book of Ruth doesn't tell us why. I don't know exactly why Ruth decides to, to claim Jehovah, Yahweh, as her God, but she does. And so at the, at the peak of this famine, they have lost everything. I don't know what kind of sickness, what kind of illness took their husbands um, and, and Naomi's sons but they've lost it all. They're completely devastated. And so finally, Naomi, who is a God-fearing woman, decides to return back home. And she goes back to her hometown of Bethlehem. And as she gets there, it's, it's barley season and, and crops have begun to grow again. It's actually pretty good news for them, but they don't have anything. And, and even the close relatives that should take them in, we're going to find out in just a second, for the most part, don't want to have anything to do with them. And so Ruth, who has promised her mother-in-law that she'll take care of her, that's exactly what she does. She begins to work in the fields, and, and it was customary back then, if you were a property owner and you had crops, that as your, as your laborers, as they picked all the crops from the field, as they gleaned the, the grains, that they would leave just a little bit around the edges, leave a little bit behind, and those who were not as fortunate, those who were poor and hungry, could come along and work for free. They didn't get paid to do this. Really, their payment was they could, they could pick up the extras that were left. And so that's what Ruth is doing. And so one day Ruth is out in the field, and the field owner, his name is Boaz, sees her. She catches his eye. She's a beautiful young woman. And he strikes up a conversation, finds out who she is and what she's all about, and even instructs one of his, uh, one of his workers, one of his laborers, to leave a little extra behind, to, to not give her a hard time. Because, you know, sometimes the workers, they would, they would be kind of stingy with what they would leave. And, and, and if those who were less fortunate came in and tried to get maybe a little extra or, or get too much, whatever the case, they would give them a hard time. And so Boaz was trying to kind of protect Ruth. And what happens is this romance begins to bud. 
And we find out in, in Ruth chapter 3 that Naomi is giving Ruth some instructions for uh, getting Boaz to fall in love with her. But even more than that, what they've discovered is that Boaz is actually a close relative. He is or has the potential to be what the Israelites would call the kinsman redeemer. It's a close family member that under the, the, the Hebrew law of the Old Testament, if a brother dies, a husband dies, and there's a wife that's left behind, and there's any property that's left behind, then the kinsman redeemer, the next closest relative, has the responsibility to, to purchase the land if there's land to be purchased, but also to marry the, the wife if the wife doesn't have any children, to marry the wife of the dead brother so that she can bear a child and carry on the family legacy, the family name, of the, of the dead husband or the dead brother. And they find out that Boaz potentially could be this kinsman redeemer. And so in Ruth chapter 3, Naomi tells Ruth to, you know, get cleaned up, get a shower, put on a nice dress, put on some makeup, you know, some perfume, look good, smell good, and go where Boaz has been working uh, on the threshing floor. And when he when he's finished his work day, he's going to enjoy a, a great dinner, a feast, something to drink. And then as he starts to doze off at the, the end of the day, simply go in and lay at his feet because he's sleeping actually on the threshing floor. It's the middle of, of harvest season. But present yourself to him and he will tell you what to do. And so we get this, this man, just this hard twist at the end of Ruth chapter 3, where Boaz wakes up to Ruth at his feet, discovers that, that this is what's going on, and, and he does, in fact, want to marry her, want to redeem her, except there's another relative that stands in the way. And so as we open up in Ruth chapter 4, Ruth, frankly, doesn't have a whole lot of hope for the future. She doesn't have a whole lot of hope for Boaz because, well, there's this other close relative that she doesn't know anything about, and, and he actually has the responsibility for taking care of, of Ruth and Naomi and the property. And so at the beginning of Ruth chapter 4, Boaz sits at the city gate. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of like the town square where men of, of, uh, of good standing, property owners, leaders in the community, they would come, they would sit, they would have conversations, they would work deals. If there was a lawsuit to be filed, to, you know, something to, to argue about, the elders would meet there and they would determine the outcome. And so Boaz is there, as he probably was pretty regularly, and this other close family member comes walking by. And so Boaz stops him and pulls him over. And, and he gathers around some witnesses, 10 other elders, so that they can witness the, the conversation and, and be kind of the, the, the judges uh, if there's any dispute later on. And so he tells this other close relative, who, by the way, is unnamed. I'm going to come back to that in a second. He tells this other close relative about the property that's available. And that he is the next in line, the, the redeemer of the property. And Boaz goes on to say that, that, listen, if you can't buy it, if you don't want it, I'll take it. I'll be the, the kinsman redeemer. And so this unnamed close relative says, yes, absolutely, I want the property. But then Boaz shares with him the rest of the story. And he says, well, actually tied to this property is Naomi and Ruth. Most importantly is, is Ruth. And so if you are the kinsman redeemer who buys the property, you will also have to take Ruth as your wife. She is an immigrant girl from Moab. And so this unnamed close relative says, no, actually in verse 6 it says this, then I can't redeem it, the family member replied, because this might endanger my own estate. You redeem the land, I cannot. Listen, the reason that this 
man is unnamed is because this is actually a dishonorable thing to do. It's, it's his responsibility to take care of Ruth, but he, he decides not to do it. And so the writers of the Old Testament decided to not bring honor to his name by even including it in the story. And I, I think this man is where many of us find ourselves today. The future is uncertain, right? He says, I can't do it. It might endanger my heritage, my, my legacy. It might endanger what I'm giving to my own kids. You take care of it. I, I don't want the responsibility of that. You see, it's his own worry that keeps him from making, honestly, it's a sacrifice. There's a sacrifice that he has to make. It, it keeps him from making the sacrifice, but his worry also keeps him from the blessing that's going to come from it. Listen, worry simply breeds uncertainty and doubt. Worry never helped anybody, but a lot of us are worrying right now. In uncertain times, like right now, we need certainty and clarity. The problem is, Worrying in the middle of uncertainty does not bring certainty or clarity. Certainty is what to expect. It's knowing what to expect. Clarity is knowing how we should respond. And the reality is worry brings neither of those things, not at all. And so actually in the New Testament, in the book of Matthew, Jesus teaches us about worry. I want to read a few verses to you. Matthew 6.25 says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to Him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? I mean, ask yourself that question. Has worrying over the last two or three or four weeks, has it helped at all? I mean, does, does worrying ever help? The first thing, if you're taking notes that I would write down is simply this. Worrying does not add to. It only takes away from. Worry does not add to, to our confidence. Worry does not add to our clarity and our certainty. Worry does not benefit us at all. It only takes away from us. It robs us of our time. It robs us of our energy. It often robs us of our relationships with our, with our spouses, our kids, our other family members. Because our own worrying tends to not only drive us crazy, but drives them crazy and may even drive them away. Jesus goes on to say this, verse 28, And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. See, what Jesus is saying is, listen, listen, I'm not telling you to run around naked, all right? That's, that's not what this is about. But why spend so much time consumed with, with the physical things of this world? Why spend so much time consumed with getting your hair just right, getting your clothes just right, worrying about what somebody else is going to think about you? I mean, come on, hasn't coronavirus and, and the whole pandemic kind of, you know, the, 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 the shelter at home taught us all that, you know, it really doesn't matter how your hair's cut because if you get a COVID cut, it's not going to look good anyway. And, and come on, I wore like the same pair of pants for almost a week last week. I mean, you know, it, it's just, <laughs> it seems like right now those things don't really matter so much because we're not leaving the house. But the reality is most of the time we worry what other people think about us. But when we worry, again, it doesn't help us at all. So number two, if you're taking notes, I would write this down. Because I, I, I think this is what Jesus is saying here is, you do all you can do, right? You do all you can do. Yes, take a shower, brush your teeth, get dressed, do your hair, put on your clothes, right? You do all you can do. You do all you can do, but trust God to do what only He can do. Listen, God makes the rain fall and the sun come out and the flowers grow. God also causes us, empowers us, equips us to have a good life. He equips us to, to be kingdom bringers and, and to go out into the world and share the gospel. God loves us. He take, 
he takes care of us and he is going to provide for all of our needs. But verse 30 ends this way. It goes on to say this. Why do you have so little faith? See, Jesus then twists it and he, he makes worry a faith issue. It's not just a physical issue. You see, we ask these, these physical questions. We get concerned about a virus, about, about are we going to have toilet paper? We get concerned about wearing masks and going to the grocery store. And those are all physical questions. And listen, they're all good questions to, to ask. But when we ask these physical questions, we're looking for physical answers. And what Jesus is teaching in Matthew is that there's more than just the physical. There's more than just the temporal. There's more than just this earth and what happens on the earth. There's also spiritual. There's a spiritual principle to be learned here. So he goes on to say, why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and He will give you everything you need. It says in verse 32, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Worry is a faith issue. So number three, when we worry, we get things out of order. We are not putting God first. We're not putting God first. I find it very interesting. Matthew chapter 6 is what we're reading from. And, and, and in this context of talking about worrying, actually just a few verses before, the, the context that Jesus is, is speaking in, He actually sets up with verse 19 talking about money. He says this, and I'm sure you've heard this verse before, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moth where moths eat them and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and steal. Verse 20, store your treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. And here's the key verse. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Listen, I've taught you this before. Where your treasure goes, your heart goes. It's like a dollar sign hooked up to a heart. Wherever you put most of your money, that's the thing that you're going to be most passionate about. And the opposite is also true. Wherever you, where, whatever you are most passionate about, that's what you're going to spend most of your money on. I love my kids, I spend money on my kids. I love my wife, I spend money on my wife. I love my church, I spend money on my church. Some of you are hunters and you spend spend tons of money on hunting equipment. You're fishermen, you spend tons of money on a a boat and a fishing rod. There's nothing wrong with that. Some of you ladies, you, you enjoy shoes and shopping. You like getting your nails done and your hair done. You spend money on that. That's not the issue, okay? I'm not picking on any of that. But there's a spiritual principle here that I don't want us to miss And yes, Jesus is talking about money, but it's more than just that. It's more than just the physical. It's the spiritual. So where your money goes, your heart goes. Where your heart goes, your money goes. I want to change it just a little bit this week and then go back and apply it to Ruth and apply it back to us. And I want to change the wording to this. Your greatest devotion determines your greatest emotion. Your greatest devotion determines your greatest emotion, right? So whatever you are most devoted to, what happens with that, whatever it is that you're investing your time and your treasure in, you're most devoted to it, whatever happens to that, that source of pleasure, maybe it's a person, maybe it's a thing, maybe it's a hobby, whatever happens to that hobby, that actually influences, controls, causes us to have an emotional response. And so right now, many of us are not able to spend the time that we would normally spend on our hobbies. Maybe, maybe we don't have the same amount of time to spend with our relatives, with our family members, going to the gym, going shopping, getting our hair and nails done, right? I haven't had my pedicure lately. <laughs> And so that thing that we have been most devoted to, we now feel emotionally void because we don't have it anymore. 
Whatever is your greatest devotion will determine your greatest emotion. Where your treasure is, where your time goes, that's where your heart goes. So going back to Ruth chapter 4, this, this unnamed family member, he's devoted to his family. There's nothing wrong with that. But it has become his greatest devotion, his, his legacy, his property, what he's leaving behind. And listen, we should want to leave good things behind. As a matter of fact, God teaches that, that if, a, if a father, if parents don't leave something behind for their kids, that they've not done a good job, that that's actually shameful, right? So it's a good thing. He's doing a good thing. But he has a duty under the law. He has something that God is expecting him to do. And because he's so devoted to this other area of his life, that is a good thing. He misses what's best. And I want us to be careful right now that in the middle of everything that's going on, and not just today, but you know, when this is all over months from now, years from now, that we're not so devoted to the good that we miss the great, that we miss what's best in our life. And, and Boaz doesn't allow that to happen. See, Boaz, he did the right thing, even though it required a sacrifice. So back to, to Ruth chapter 4, verse 9, it says this, Then Boaz said to the elders and to the crowd standing around, You are witnesses that today I have bought Naomi, or from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. Those are the other two sons. See, he, he said, okay, fine. You don't want to redeem it? I'll redeem it. I'm going to buy the property back, and I'm going to go one step further. Verse 10, And with the land I have acquired Ruth, the Moabite widow of Malon, to be my wife. This way she can have a son to carry on the family name of her dead husband and to inherit the family property here in his hometown. You are all witnesses today. Listen, this was a sacrifice for Boaz, and I can't tell you that he wasn't worried at all. There was, there was, I'm sure, still some anxiousness here. But his devotion to doing the right thing drove his emotions for Ruth, for Naomi, for his future legacy, for his concern for God and what God would have him do. And you may think, well, I mean, really, is it that much of a sacrifice? I mean, if he's a single dude and she's a pretty girl, you know, Listen, here's what he's sacrificing. Go, go back to, to uh, kind of the, the middle of verse 10. It says, this way she can have a son to carry on the family name of her dead husband. What's going to happen is under the law, when Boaz marries Ruth and they have their firstborn son, every dad's proud of his firstborn son. Every, every Israelite father is going to name his son Junior, right? I mean, they can't wait to carry on the family name. They get the inheritance. They get the, the, the most of the property. They get the spiritual blessing of the father. They're the only son, the firstborn son, to get that kind of a blessing. And what's going to happen to Boaz is he doesn't get to name his son Boaz Smith Jr. or whatever his last name was. He doesn't get to have a junior. Instead, he's going to be naming his son after the dead husband. That family name is going to be carried on. His firstborn son will receive his spiritual blessing, but it will go in the name of a dead man. And Boaz, Boaz is sacrificing that part of his legacy because he doesn't have any sons yet to be able to marry Ruth. But his sacrifice is not in vain. He receives a blessing. As a matter of fact, if you're taking notes, <laughs> number one, Boaz received an immediate blessing. Verse 11 says this, Then the elders and all the people standing in the gate replied, We are witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, from whom all the nation of Israel descended. Listen, Rachel and Leah, they're the mother of the Israelite nation, the mothers of the Israelite nation. Between the two of them, they had 13 kids. Everyone in Israel, every, every tribe was born from them and their children. Number two, Boaz received an additional blessing. Verse 13, So Boaz took Ruth into his home, and she became his wife. When he slept with her, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant, and she gave birth to a son. 
Then the women of the town said to Naomi, Praise the Lord who has now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be famous in Israel. He has a son. Listen, you can't just, you can't just breeze past the fact that children are a blessing. Yes, it's this, this firstborn son is going to carry on a different family name. But the Bible teaches us very clearly that God blesses us with children. The blessing of children should never be taken for granted. And finally, number three, Boaz received a future blessing. Verse 17, the neighbor women said, now at last Naomi has a son again, which is actually her grandson. <clears throat> and they named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the grandfather of David. See, Boaz and Ruth were the great grandparents of the great king David, the giant slayer, the man after God's own heart. And you know what? They're from Bethlehem, where Mary and Joseph, several generations later, would travel back to because Jesus was born of the house and the lineage of David. Ruth and Boaz were great, 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 I forget how many greats. They were great, great grandparents of Jesus of the Redeemer, our kinsman Redeemer. Naomi and Ruth return to Bethlehem, and the roots of David in Bethlehem, going back to Ruth and Boaz, are why Joseph and Mary had to go to Bethlehem to register in the census of, of Augustus in Luke chapter 2. Ruth and Boaz are the reason that Jesus is born in Bethlehem. But the consideration of Jesus in this book of Ruth doesn't begin with the mention of of just King David, Jesus has been throughout the whole book pictured by Boaz and this office of kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer had to be a family member. Jesus added humanity to his eternal deity so he could be our kinsman and save us. The kinsman redeemer had the duty of buying family members out of slavery. Jesus redeemed us from a slavery to sin and death. The kinsman redeemer had the duty of buying back land that had been forfeited. Jesus will redeem the earth that mankind sold to Satan when they first sinned. Boaz as kinsman redeemer to Ruth, was not motivated by self-interest, but motivated by love for Ruth. Jesus, as our kinsman redeemer, is motivated to redeem us by his great love for us. Boaz, as kinsman redeemer to Ruth, had to have a plan to redeem Ruth unto himself, and some might have thought his plan to be foolish. I mean, he, he kind of grabs the guy and asks him about buying property and then sort of you know, not tricks him, but, but then, you know, lets him know that Ruth's available too. And it was a gamble. It was a risk. It was, it may have been a foolish plan, but it worked. And Jesus's plan to redeem us, saving men by dying, by, by the foolishness of dying on a cross. Some might think that plan was foolish, yet the plan works and is glorious. Boaz, as kinsman redeemer to Ruth, took her as his bride. The people uh, Jesus has redeemed are collectively called the bride of Christ. Boaz, as kinsman redeemer to Ruth, provided a glorious destiny for Ruth. And Jesus, as our redeemer, provides a glorious destiny for us. Today is not a day to be sad. Today is a day for some good news, and the good news is that Jesus Christ gave himself as a ransom for you. Jesus Christ became your kinsman redeemer when he died on the cross to buy you back, to redeem you from sin and slavery. It all comes back to the idea that Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. This is why he became a man. Listen to this. God might have sent an angel to save us, but the angel would not have been our kinsman. Jesus in his eternal glory, without the addition of humanity to his divine nature, might have saved us, but he would not have been our kinsman. A great prophet or a great priest would be our kinsman, 
But his own sin would disqualify him from being our Savior, our Redeemer. Only Jesus, the eternal God, who added humanity to his deity, becoming 100% man and 100% God, only Jesus Christ could be our kinsman redeemer. Not just my redeemer, not just your redeemer, but the kinsman redeemer for all of mankind. Listen, from eternity, from the beginning of time, God had a plan for Ruth and Boaz. God knew what was going to happen to Ruth and Naomi. He knew that the famine was coming. He knew that they wouldn't have food to eat. He knew it would be hard to go to the grocery store. He knew we would have to wear masks. He knew that there would be some social distancing that would be going on. He knew that the, that the unnamed family member would not want to marry Ruth because she was from the other side of the tracks, because she was this immigrant girl who probably worshipped some other god. He knew all of those things, and yet he worked his plan. He worked his, not his magic, but his divinity into the details of Ruth and Boaz's life. And Jesus was born in Bethlehem as a result. And Jesus walked, drug, tripped, fell under the weight of his cross after being beaten as he walked up the hill, the hill of Golgotha to be nailed to a tree, to be raised up, to die for us. And on the third day, what we just celebrated last week, he rose again. Listen, this is a time to celebrate. This is good news. I don't know what you've been worrying about. I don't know in your, in your life right now, in your home, what you have been devoting yourself to. But is your devotion worth it? Or is what you are most devoted to, has it been draining your emotion? I want to invite you today to renew your devotion to God. Renew your devotion to your kinsman redeemer, to Jesus Christ, who loves you. Because apart from him, we don't really know what true love is. And so if you want to experience the greatest emotion, a peace that passes all understanding, a love that, that loved us before we were even lovable, then make Jesus your greatest devotion. Stop worrying. Give yourself to God. Do what you can do and trust God to do what only He could do. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we love you. God, I am praying for my church family. God, I'm praying for those who are watching online who, who have never trusted you as their Savior. God, I pray that even in this moment, they would realize that in their sin, they need a Redeemer. They need someone to, to buy them back out of the slavery, out of the bondage to sin. Listen, if that's you right now and you're watching online and, and you would say, I've never trusted Jesus as my Savior and I want to do that. You may not even understand what all that means, but you know that you, that you know that you need a Savior. Listen, the Bible simply says this. If we believe in our hearts that, that Jesus died on the cross and that God raised him from the dead and we confess that with our mouths, that we will be saved. And so I just want to invite you to, to pray this prayer with me. You, 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 there's nothing magic about the words, but it, it's what we believe when you believe it in your heart and you say it with your mouth. This is how we communicate to God. So I want to encourage you, just, just repeat this after me. God, thank you for loving me. I want to love you back. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you died to set me free from my sins. And I believe that you rose again, that you came back to life. And so, Jesus, I trust in you. I receive your forgiveness. Thank you for making me part of your family. Thank you for redeeming me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer today and you meant it in your heart, if it was the very first time, let us know about it. Let us know by, by leaving a comment, by sending us a, a message through Facebook Messenger, or you can email info at tcaf.com. Uh, leave, a, 
a, a comment on our YouTube page, or if you're watching at, at, at live.tcaf.com, uh, you know, click the prayer button or leave us a comment. Let us know in the chat window that you trusted Jesus as your Savior today. We want to be praying for you. We would love to connect with you. Thank you so much for joining us online today. We love you guys. Don't forget that, uh, that we've, we have Zoom on Wednesday nights. We have our, our Wednesday night prayer service. It'll be coming up in just a few days on Wednesday night. Keep watching TCAF.com for updates. I'll keep emailing and keep texting. We love you guys. Have a great day because Jesus is some good news. Bye.